medicinal applications of native plants by Native Americans. You're looking at a medicine ch chest or a medicine cabinet that would have been used by Native Americans. There were, there's a plant somewhere within vision right there that you can see that's useful for nearly any ailment that might have happened to the Native Americans. And they were very wise about how they used these plants to make something to ease a pain that they didn't have any other cure for. Uh, this list of the tribes of the Indian nation shows the diversity of the Indian tribes across the country from the East Coast to the West Coast, North to South. There were a lot of tribes. Some of them moved around a little bit throughout the, the last 100, 200 years. I'm thinking 1800s and earlier. Uh, the names typed on the left are some of the tribes I'm gonna be referencing with some of their cures or their treatments. And this quote right here comes from uh, Chief Crowfoot, what is life? It is the flash of a firefly in the night, it is the breath of a buffalo in the wintertime, it is the little shadow which runs across the grass and loses itself in the sunset. And I, I, this picture is from out in the Alpine, south of Alpine area, and it kind of reminded me of that, that quote. And where I first got that quote was from Melissa Sturdivant. Uh, she's our soil conservationist in the Coleman, Texas field office a tribal liaison for the Texas NRCS and a member of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. Now, when this COVID started, NRCS virtually went uh, full-time teleworking. Every employee was told, take your laptop home and you'll work from home until further notice. And after about two, three weeks, I, I got to noticing that, you know, we weren't able to go out and give trainings to employees weren't able to get together. And I was hoping to try to keep our employees sharp on plant identification and plant knowledge. And so I started sending out as a daily plant of the day, old magazine articles that I'd written. And we were able to do this for about two months. And with each article that went out, several photos and an article about the plant, uh, I put in the email a quote, a uh, historical quote, uh, a lot of Aldo Leopold, Hugh Hammond Bennett, the first chief of the Natural Resources Conservation Service, and others. And I got to notice in some of the plants really would have benefited from a quote of a Native American. And I asked Melissa if she could find some quotes related to certain plants. And she came up with some, and I went back and asked her more than once. And she, she always found good quotes. And she found this one. And I want you to you know, read that again. That, that's, that gentleman was born almost 200 years ago. He was wise, a wise man, as I'm sure many of the chiefs were, and had a, had a lot of forethought about how, how interconnected the Indian tribes were with the plants, the animals, and their habitat. And so I appreciate Melissa uh, sharing that with me. And now let's... Uh, get some definitions out of the way before we start looking at the plants. Because some of these, they're always referencing different treatments. Uh, if, they, if they mention a wash, then I went and found some definitions off the internet. A liquid medicinal preparation used especially for cleansing, eye wash, or mouthwash. So it would, would have been mixed with water and just used to clean. An infusion. Now, in today's world, an infusion is normally thought of as a shot, uh, you know, something internally, uh, uh, transfusions, blood, you know, blood transfusions, things like that. But in the world of the Native Americans, this was when they mixed the plant parts with water and steeped it, hot water usually, and that would make a tea. So an infusion to the Native Americans was, was like a tea to us. A decoction, a long-term boiling of extracts uh, from the roots and bark. So they would boil this and condense it to get the, the good medicinal, medicinal parts out of the roots and out of the bark. A tincture are concentrated herbal extracts made by soaking the bark's berries, leaves, or roots 
from one or more plants in alcohol or vinegar. And the reason that they would use the alcohol and vinegar, it may have had some water too, but they would add the alcohol to pull out the active ingredients in the plant parts, a very concentrated soaking of the plant parts. And then a poultice. And we're always hearing about, if you watch the old Western movies, the outlaw Josie Whale comes to mind when they were getting ready to cross that ferry and Granny was sitting on the porch and told them that she had a poultice for a bullet wound and mind you keep a, she said, mind that you keep a few drops of water on that poultice. So this was something that the settlers used as well as the Native Americans, a paste made of herbs, plants, or other substances that were believed to have healing properties. And it would be spread on a warm moist cloth and you'll see it could be spread on some plant parts that we'll get to and applied to the body to relieve inflammation and promote healing. So those are the different uses we'll be talking about. Let's get right into our plants. Indian plantain. This one is common up in the northern part of the state. I'll show you a map here in just a minute. The Cherokee used a poultice for cuts, bruises, tumors, and infections. Now I can believe it might help on the cuts, bruises, and infections. I wonder about the tumors, but again, a lot of this was a medicinal trial by faith. You had to believe it was gonna help you, and hopefully it did. But here's where it can be found in the, uh, basically the eastern half of the state of Texas, with the one exception being far west, out around, looks like maybe Nolan County. And those of you that are from all four corners of the state, I'll have plants in here for, for every corner, every region. So you'll get to see something you're familiar with, and hopefully you'll get to see something from another part of the state that you may not be familiar with. But here are the flowers of Indian plantain on the left, the developing seeds inside those little pods on the right. And let's make sure we're all understanding the, the colors of these distribution maps. All of these maps are from the Biota of North America program, commonly called BOMAP. If you just take the B-O-N-A-P of the first letter of the name. The dark green color, as you see here, the species present in the state and it's native. The light green color, which designates the counties that that plant occurs in, that's the county color. Species present and are not rare. Now we may see a plant later on that is yellow. That would indicate that that plant is present in a state but it's rare to find it. And then we'll see some that are pink colored. So pink color uh, county designations indicate that that plant is on a noxious plant list, has a weeding nature about it. So that's the colors that we're gonna see. And I like to see these distribution maps to see sometimes the plants are widespread, sometimes they're just in three or four counties in the state. Here's one of those that's just in what, five counties in the northeastern corner, the Texas Panhandle. But Rocky Mountain bee plant, as you might figure from the name, is more common in all, all of the states north and west of the Panhandle of Texas. So the TY used an infusion, a tea, of plant parts taken, a plant taken for stomach disorders, stomach ache maybe, and a poultice of the plant used on the abdomen. And the plant was eaten by the Pueblo tribe. Uh, this photo on the right was taken in the Panhandle, up, up in the Pampa area, so it was right in there about where the distribution map shows it to be found. These photos were taken in New Mexico, and again, it, it shows up in the county where it was found. But you can see the seed pods hanging out. The uh, several tribes in the western states would eat the seeds, they would pound the seeds up into a flyer and cook with them. They described that the leaves could be cooked like greens and water and a little, little grease and uh, you know treatment for anemia and insect bites. Take some of that juice that you were cooking for, me, for your supper and put it on an insect bite. So some of these plants had dual uses. Look up here in the upper right hand corner of this picture on the right. This is narrow leaf globe mallow. We're going to see it later but look right here. If one of those people looking for plants were to walk in this area, there's two right there that they could use. Maybe it was different treatments, but there's two usable plants in that one photo. Wild licorice. Also, as far as Texas, is found in the Panhandle, 
uh, the High Plains, the Rolling Plains, and a couple of counties down in the uh, Big Bend region. It's also in the basically the western half of Oklahoma, Kansas, and the states north and west. Wild licorice likes to be in deep sandy soils, and that photo on the right was taken again north of Pampa on a tributary of the Canadian River. The uses for it, a tea was made of the peeled dried roots or leaves used for diarrhea and upset stomach. The root chewed and held in the mouth for toothache. A tea could be made of the roots for coughs, chest pain, and sore throat. And then the root boiled in water to make a tea drunk to speed delivery of the placenta. Leaves steeped in water used for earache. And we would probably hope that they used warm water like we always wanted to use that warm oil for earache treatment. Um, look at the, you know, the uses, lots of uses for that one plant. And look at the, uh, the seed pods. They look like miniature. They're about half size cuckleburs. And they do have Velcro like hooks on those pods and they get caught on animal hair. The buffalo probably carried those for miles and miles before they might've fallen off. But that helped the Native Americans because it did spread the plant to where they could find it in new places. And hopefully, as the buffalo carried that plant and the buffalo stayed in an area a while, Native Americans could find it with the buffalo. Rattlesnake Massacre might give you in the name a uh, trait that it's used for. Uh, it said the Cherokee used a tincture, so they were, you know, cooking this down, adding some alcohol to it maybe making it a little easier to swallow, but for whooping cough, disease brought in by the settlers. Used by many tribes as a treatment for snake bite, chewing of the root, increased sal saliva. Not sure that's gonna help on a snake bite, but it maybe made them feel better. And then the Natchez, uh, and this is kind of interesting, the stem and leaves chewed to stop nosebleed. You know, if you're, if you're near this plant and you get a nosebleed, that's good information to know. Uh, there's the distribution, the eastern third of the state of Texas is where it's commonly found. A couple of counties there, looks like San Antonio and maybe a county north of there, but predominantly the eastern uh, third of Texas. And you look at the other counties in those other states, Rattlesnake Master in Texas is at the western edge of its range. The Rocky Mountain bee plant was on the eastern edge of its range in Texas. So we're kind of, we're in the overlap zone for a lot of these plants. Here's the uh, flower heads as they mature and then a very pretty picture in the middle of a kind of a foggy morning uh, with the rattlesnake master, uh, not real showy after it flowers, but there it is in all its glory. Frostweed, now this is a common plant in Texas. You can see the distribution, kind of the Eastern half of the state especially in the hill country. It's real common under every oak tree in the hill country. Uh, the leaves were dried and used as a substitute for tobacco by many native tribes, most of those tribes to the east of Texas. And the frost weed, if you're not familiar, the first frost in the fall, the sap has a lot of moisture in it. And when that sap freezes, it splits the stem open and the, the sap is exuded out as frost driven. Those will melt in a couple of hours, so you've got to be out early to see it. If there's enough moisture in the soil, the plant will pick up moisture, and the next week, if it freezes again, it'll crack open and exude out those ribbons again. It doesn't kill the plant. May apple. Now we're looking over in the East Texas, Piney Woods, the Post Oak Savannah, the very northeastern part of the coastal prairie. These are pretty plants. All those low-growing plants here in that left photo are may apples. The roots were a strong purgative used by the Eastern tribes. Again, we're on the Western edge of it. Uh, this plant's uh, been known to be in Fannin County. Grayson County is right here, the very, right on the Red River. The county east of it is Fannin County. And it's been seen in that county. It's not marked, but it, it is there. Um, easy to transplant. You can get it to grow just by digging the roots and transplanting. The ripe fruit that you see down there on the bottom is edible. People make custard pies using those, or you can eat them raw, but all other plant parts are poisonous. The roots, the leaves, the stem, the flower, all poisonous, 
But if you knew what you were doing, as some of these Eastern tribes apparently did, then you could make a medicine from it. A little, little of it was good, a lot of it might kill you. Spanish moss. Just think about having to find something to put over a deep cut to hope, hopefully slow the flow of blood and wrap a, wrap a bandana or a wool blanket or something around it. The Spanish moss looks like it would be excellent for that. And apparently it was used uh, widely with no ill effects. So it was used as a dressing. This is one I'm a little surprised that anyone would want to use. Now notice in Texas, it shows up in a few counties, the Eastern third, but it's, it's widespread, more common than what it shows up. Those counties in pink mean that they, they're treating it in New Mexico, uh, Arkansas, Louisiana as a noxious plant. But the Cherokee used a poultice to crush plants, plant stems to treat bruises and inflammation. So you see that often, uh, maybe try it, crush it up, see if you can put it on a scratch, see if it makes it feel better. Illinois bundle flower, one of our really good premier wildlife plants. Deer love to eat this plant, cattle eat it. Wild game birds, songbirds of all kinds eat these seeds. So what we know is a very desirable forage and wildlife plant, the Pawnee used a leaf tea wash for skin irritations. That would be something we could try very easily. You can find Illinois bundle flower on the roadsides and barges. This is a beautiful plant. I thought it was a lot more rare, but this distribution map shows it to be pretty common up and down the Blackland Prairie, uh, post oak savannah, a couple of counties, and over into East Texas. White trout lily, dog tooth violet. The Eastern tribes, again, were on the Western edge of its range. Eastern tribes made a root poultice to reduce swelling, a leaf poultice for ulcers, and a root tea for fever, and then the fresh and dried leaves used as a cough medicine. So there are four different treatments for that from that one plant, and it is a beautiful plant. I've seen it once in Dallas County, uh, Cedar Hill Nature Area, March, early April. You'll catch it in flower. You might see these leaves, these spotted trout-like leaves, like the spots on a rainbow trout or a brook trout or something, you might see those leaves more often than you'll see the flowers. Sand lily, mint zillia species, all mint zillias were used by the native tribes. Cheyenne, Dakota, Zuni used the gummy juice and the roots to treat fevers, arthritis, and other European illness, smallpox, and other illnesses. And I think it's probably more common than the distribution map reflects. All parts of this plant will stick to you. The leaves have little Velcro hooks, and if you get them on your jeans, instead of trying to pick it off green, let them dry. And you can take a pocket knife and just scrape them off your jeans. They'll come off real easy. You, you can hardly pick them off when they're green. They are stuck that hard. Another name for sand lily because of the petals of the flower is 10 petal mint zilia. But here are the seed pods down here with these little spider-like leg uh, bracts and then the petals up here. And then there's a yellow mint zilia that was also used by the Native Americans. Again, all mint zilia had, had a purpose. Stick leaf, also called chick thief, is uh, one that deer will eat on and we find it a lot in disturbed areas. Like, looks like it's on a little gravel pile right here. So used by lots of native tribes. And we're kind of, this is kind of a Great Plains plant. So east, west part of Texas, all the way up to Canada, this is where this plant would have been common. White prickly poppy. Uh, I'm surprised that this one's not up in the panhandle because I've seen it in the panhandle. Seen it all the way up there to Pampa but it's not showing up in the panhandle. So, so no one has collected it and sent it to a herbarium for it to be documented in the panhandle. But the, the tea was made from seeds to be a purgative. And the seeds look like miniature golf balls. They've got dimples just like a golf ball. And then an infusion would be given for colic and headache using white prickly poppy. And nothing grazes this plant so if it was growing, it'd be easy to find and easy to get parts from it. It has a yellow sap if you break a stem off. 
the gay feathers, Lytra species. Uh, the corms were used as a treatment for sore throat and snake bite, giving another common name of button snake root. Now, there's about 10 different species of gay feather in Texas. And I think this map is actually a composite map of all 10 species. But in North Central Texas, we commonly have narrow leaf gay feather. And if you dig one up and it's got a long tapered carrot like root, that's going to be narrow leaf. If you dig one up from about Graham to Brownwood West, that's going to be dotted gay feather. And it, the corm on it will look like an onion. It'll be rounded. So lots of uses, widely available plant. Uh, and it's, it's visible all summer long. And then when it gets those purple spiked flowers in the fall, uh, monarchs really go to it as well as other pollinators, but it was visible most of the summer. Two of the ironweeds, woolly ironweed with the narrow leaves and Baldwin's ironweed with those wider uh, lance shaped leaves occurring in the central part of the state, although Baldwin's ironweed is also found up in the panhandle. The roots used to purify the blood to reduce fever and as an aphrodisiac and a snake bite care. Uh, care. Cherokee used a root tea of one species of ironweed, it didn't uh, specify which one, to prevent pregnancy and it could relieve pain of afterbirth and treat stomach ulcers. So it could cure everything apparently from preventing pregnancy to relieving the pain of afterbirth and a sore stomach and everything. Prairie spiderwort. When I read this quote about the Dakota using this plant as a love charm when, while singing, I thought, well, though, those young braves, they had this plant figured out because you know the spiderwort always has three, three petals. She loves me. She loves me not. She loves me. So see, those, those young braves had it figured out. And then the uh, Navajo used a cold infusion, it wasn't boiled, just a cold infusion of root externally uh, and internally for deer infection. And I went and looked that up and that is referencing deer ticks. And I guess probably what that refer represents is what we would call Lyme disease now. So this was a cure or at least a treatment for Lyme disease by the Native Americans. And look at where it grows all over the state of Texas. So, and throughout the Great Plains and Western states, some species of spiderwort. Purple prairie clover is another one of our very showy wildflowers. Various plains tribes use this as an antibacterial plant. And it could said to uh, help heal heart problems, measles, pneumonia, and taken probably is that decoction like a syrup for general preventative medicine. The way some people take elderberry syrup now as a preventative, this might have been the elderberry of the Native American world. While Bergamot, uh, Juliet Carter in Weatherford first showed me uh, pictures of this plant growing on her property. And I got real excited about it. It looks, you know, it's a fabulous looking plant. It only makes one flower per year but that flower is quite beautiful. The Cherokee and Kiowa used it to treat heart ailments and insect bites. The Apache, Hopi, and Tiwa used it as a seasoning and to preserve meats. Now, if you smell this plant, the leaves, the flowers, the dry ripens, uh, fruits all have a distinctive smell, almost a citrus smell. And look at, it's kind of interesting that it is really common east of Texas and then New Mexico in the Trans-Pecos has quite a bit of counties with it. Uh, but the, the central part of the state, it kind of skipped over. Here's the flower on the right. Look at those little fuzzy hairs. This, this uh, Juliet got several of these photos published in the, the Native Plant Society newsletter a few is issues back. And look at the little pollinators on it. It's being used. But what I want to call your attention to now, down here at the bottom, after the flowers pollinated, once this begins to make seed, I put some of those dried flower heads under a microscope and look at the uh, red, the little red, uh, I call them rubies. They look like little rubies half buried in those uh, seed pods. 
Very interesting, very unusual to see that. And under a microscope with light on them, they shine like rubies, very beautiful. You can find this plant and put it under about a 20, 25 power uh, magnifier, you'll see the rubies. Lire leaf sage, a lot of the sages were used by different uh, plains tribes. Um, Cherokee used it as an infusion to check bowels, as a cough and cold medicine, or as a laxative. So it could help you on either end, the laxative end or to plug you up. And then a syrup of the leaves mixed with honey taken for asthma. This might have been adopted uh, mixing it with honey as a, a way to make it a little sweeter for kids to take it. Uh, good, good use of the, the natural ingredients. Honey was available after the Europeans brought it to, uh, brought the bees to the New World. If you're walking along a riparian area, you'll see a lot of different little riparian plants. We're going to talk about water hyssop, and it's found in the southern half of the state of Texas. If you look at it real close, that's what it looks like. Lots of little green stems, above ground stolons running back and forth, making interlocked uh, netting. Uh, the white flowers used medicinally for asthma, improving blood clotting and memory retention. So, you know, with a lot of those injuries back in that day, they needed to stop the flow of blood. And that, so they would probably go down to the creek to find water, to get a drink of water, as well as treat that injury and help stop the, uh, the blood flow. If you look at the distribution map of Silverleaf Nightshade, you notice that New Mexico, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Louisiana are colored in pink, indicating that they consider this a noxious plant. And it truly is a noxious weed. If you ask any cotton farmer, they'll tell you that. Shows up on rangeland, pasture land, uh, the ripe berries were used by Southwest tribes in making cheese. You take those yellow berries, crush them up, and mix it in with cream from the milk cow, and it will curdle the cream, which is the starting process of making cheese. It's also used down in Old Mexico to make cheese. Uh, berries were also used in treating sore throat and toothache. And even though you can make cheese with it, the berries themselves are poisonous. So you got to be careful what you're using, know what you're using. Uh, really, I've seen this plant a lot out in pastures and hadn't paid it much mind, but if you look at all of the different uses for yarrow, the crushed fresh leaves stops bleeding in a poultice and relieves rashes. Uh, perhaps the stems or roots were used to help stop internal bleeding and local as a local anesthetic used by several tribes. So just look at all the, the different uses that it had. Uh, great plant, very common across much of the Great Plains, uh, the mountainous west, and the middle part of the state of Texas, and probably more common than what the distribution maps reflect. Rain snake weed, more commonly known to people that study range management as perennial broomweed. And the Navajo used it to treat snake bite. And that's where it gets the other name of snakeweed. It's, uh, we have annual broomweed more commonly right here in North Central Texas, but there you can find on gravelly shallow sites like in these photos or in clay soils, really hard clay uh, outcropping areas, you'll find perennial broomweed even in the cross timbers and a little bit of the blackland prairie where you find those outcroppings. So it shows up over two thirds of the Western state. And we're again on the eastern edge of its range. It goes way west all the way to California. The regular old common annual sunflower. Notice now Texas is on board with calling annual sunflower a noxious weed because it's colored pink. But poultice of the flowers were used by, for burns. The crushed root applied as a mash to draw a blister or maybe a thorn out, that would be useful. Roots chewed and applied to swollen area of rattlesnake bites after the venom was sucked out. Hope that helped them. And American Indians used a flower tea for lung ailments and malaria. And leaf tea taken for high fevers and astringent poultice on snake bites and spider bites. And it said there was over 3,000 years of use of annual sunflower by the 
various plains tribes. So a plant we hardly pay second attention to really has been used quite a bit by the Native Americans. And it was common. So it, was, it would have been one they would have tried to find healing qualities in, and they found some. Now here's a perennial sunflower that hopefully you're familiar with, Maximilian sunflower. The roots, the rhizomes, the underground horizontal roots were eaten by Sioux and other Western tribes. And I saw this reference that the early pioneers would grow this plant near their home, their dugout, their cabin, whatever they were living in to repel mosquitoes. And they used the blossoms in bath water to relieve arthritis pain. That's something we could try today. Just take some of those leaves and soak them in your bath water. Look at the distribution map of where it grows, kind of the central, well, central half, central two thirds of the state of Texas. Shows up in El Paso, shows up out there, uh, Marfa, I guess that is, out in the Big Bend, up in the Panhandle. But doesn't look like it goes down in the South Texas or it doesn't grow under the tall pines in the piney woods. But the best thing about Maximilian, I think, in the fall is when it's in flower in September and October when the monarchs are going south. And look at the uh, distribution map now. The direct path north from north to south through Texas that the monarchs take, that's where the Maximilian shows up the most. So that's good. We need this plant for the pollinators. Prairie coneflower. Again, look how common it was. Nearly all counties in Texas show it, used by many tribes across many states. Cheyenne's called it rattlesnake medicine. The Lakota made a tea to cure stomach ache and relieve headaches. Now, this plant is really common and would have been made more common by overgrazing of the settlers as they were homesteading lands and moving in and displacing the Native Americans this plant would have come in uh, more common than what it was when the Native Americans were here. It's a common weed now, especially in the hill country of Texas. Some pastures, this is the dominant plant in that pasture. Cattle won't eat it and deer won't eat it. Sheep and goats won't eat it. Brown-eyed Susan was used by the Cherokee to cook the juice from the roots to treat for earache. That's a specific use of one plant. Treating the root, using the root to treat earache. And they also said a tea could be made from the dried leaves and flowers. And I found this photo on the upper right in the plant's database photo sections. And they cut that flower in half and you can see the ripening seeds, the brown seeds at the bottom and the newer seeds forming at the top. So very interesting photo. This plant, again, eastern half of the state of Texas, but nearly all Oklahoma, Louisiana, Arkansas, you know, it's, it's a widespread use. Uh, Brown-eyed Susan, Susan grows in lots of places. Now this is one that a farmer will certainly call a weed. In fact, it's also known as cowpen daisy, uh, but golden crown beard is its true na name, uh, used for treating balls, skin diseases, and spider bites. Uh, really common, it's probably more common in the rolling plains than what it shows up on this map because it likes sandy soils, and there are a lot of sandy soils in the rolling plains. But it was used by a lot of tribes. We're on the eastern edge again. It's more common to the north and west, western states. Here it is on a ranch in Hill, uh, Mills County. This ranch has had a lot of live oaks die to oak wilt. And this was in the September of 2018. Look at the uh, cowpen daisies coming up under those dead live oaks. That wasn't planted. That wasn't uh, done. Mother Nature did this. With the sunlight able to hit the ground, now that these plants were dead, these trees were dead, and there's moisture in the soil, look at the cowpen daisy growing, and look at the visitors, queen's butterflies, monarch butterflies, mid-September 2018. So if the Native Americans were out hunting and they came upon something like that, that was, that was a medicine chest just opened up waiting for them to use it. And so as the disturbance to the ground, that's what really caused this, the, the sunlight hitting the ground, the seeds were already there. These seeds are everywhere. They just needed a chance to come up. 
narrow leaf pacoon, also called fringe pacoon because of the fringe around the margin of those beautiful yellow flowers. The Navajos chewed the root for coughs and cold treatment. Many tribes use the root for a red dye that it produces and the Blackfeet burned the dried tops as incense during ceremonies. Look at the distribution map in Texas, it's everywhere. There is a oddity though in this flower. These showy yellow flowers, which will appear in March and early April, are all show and no go. These flowers do not produce seeds. They're not, they're not pollinated. About a month after the March, April, occurrence of these yellow flowers, tiny white flowers that are self-fertile uh, called Clastogamus flowers. I had to write that there so I could remember how to say it. Uh, these flowers form and you can see the seeds now being produced. These seeds will turn white later. They look like a shiny knight's helmet. If you find them in a quail crop. So that's a second set of flowers this plant produces, but that's actually the the small little white flower that's very little show, but it has all the go in producing seeds. I told you we'd see narrow leaf globe mallow again. The roots used by many Western tribes for coughs, cold remedies. The Pima used it for stomach issues and as an anti-diarrheal. The Tiwa applied a poultice of pulverized roots to perlant sores. Now I had to go look that up. But perlant sore is that old sore that's kind of got that yellow or green crust coming out of it. So that's a bad sore. And they would take and make a poultice with the pulverized roots mixed with some sort of water or something, some maybe honey, to keep it in that uh, poultice and hopefully treat that sore and get it better. And as a snake bite uh, treatment. Commonly found in the western half of the state, they show in a Currents right here in Tarrant County, maybe, don't know. And then one way down here about Huntsville or somewhere. Don't know about that, but it's common in the western half of the state, rolling plains. Uh, I see it out there quite a bit. In fact, these orange photos right here on the left, these were taken in Crosby County, somewhere about right in here. Uh, but it has different color variation, not related to the soil, it's just differences in the plant. It's all narrow leaf globe mallow, no matter what color it has. And I have seen south of Alpine near Elephant Mountain wildlife management area, a white flowered narrow leaf globe mallow. Didn't have any photos of it, but I have seen it out there. And for those of you out on the far west, uh, Desert Holly, a little six to eight inch tall plant, has a very holly-like leaf. Uh, a decoction of the entire plant, while toxic, was used medicinally. And kind of ironically, in Mexico, they take this plant and develop a rat poison using it. But to each his own, a little bit of a, something might, might just help. The wine cup or poppy mallow, Lakota, used a decoction of the root taken for internal pains. The, the, the smoke from the dried root being burned was used to bathe aching body parts. So you'd hold your elbow out over that smoke and hopefully that would make you feel better. The root smoke would be inhaled for head cold treatment. And it was also eaten by many tribes, Osage and many tribes cooked the, the root. Uh, here in this photo in the middle, you can see the fruits, uh, the seeds being developed after the flower has fallen away. And pretty much most counties in Texas are gonna have wine cup. There's an annual wine cup and a perennial wine cup that we have in Texas. Now let's start looking at a few of our shrubs and trees. Uh, ephedra, also commonly known as Mormon's tea, uh, with the botanical name of Ephedra antisyphilitica, antisyphilitica, maybe antisyphilis or a treatment for syphilis. That's in the scientific name. And the Pima out in Arizona used this plant to treat syphilis. They used an infusion of the stems and water to treat the syphilis, uh, treat for it. The Tiwa chewed the leaves and stems and are used a decoction taken for diarrhea. So I'm gonna remember this about this plant and diarrhea. If you're ever out and have to chew on a stem, that's, that's okay. But what's interesting, uh, the Pima in Arizona used this plant, but notice it doesn't grow in Arizona. 
And we'll come back to that in a second. So here's the, the plants out in the wild. Here are the flowers on the far right hand side, probably uh, March, early April in the middle photo. The fruits, a brown football shaped seed surrounded by this reddish fleshy husk. Uh, these seeds are formed in May. So if you want to collect seeds of ephedra, you've got to be in May looking for it. Uh, if you wait till June, the quail that are feeding up underneath the bushes have probably eaten all the seeds. And that's one reason that we don't ever see this seed in a quail crop taken during hunting season. The seeds are produced in May. Quail are not hunted until November, December through February. So the seeds have already been eaten by the time quail hunting comes around. But now let's go back to that. The Pima uh, in Arizona and the Mormons in Utah. So how does, how does our plant in Texas that doesn't occur that far west relate to this story? I think this is the plant, green ephedra, ephedra viridis, I can't say that one. Uh, look down here at the bottom, it has alternate names of Mormon tea. So this is probably the one that would have been used for the treatment of syphilis by the Pima and the Mormons. But we get to, we get to keep the name of ephedra antisyphilitica for our ephedra that grows in Texas. Arizona black walnut. Uh, interesting that not a medicinal plant, but you can take these green husks that are surrounding the walnut, uh, crush those husks up, drop them down into a creek that has a little pool of water and it will kill the fish. So you can go fishing without having to do any work. Uh, interesting use. Now, Arizona black walnut occurs out in the Trans-Pecos, uh, Edwards Plateau, up into the Cross Timbers and just barely into the Blackland Prairie. I've seen it in Palo Pinto County. I've seen it in Mills County. Uh, and here it is growing in Mills County on a pretty steep slope. Now, those of you from the Big Bend country in, in Central Texas, this is what we call a mountain. It's probably not 600 feet high, but it's, it's a mountain over here. But that's, that's a plant that can grow in some pretty inhospitable conditions. If you think you might have stumbled on a walnut, if you take a stem, maybe a pencil size or a little bit larger than a pencil, cut it open to where you can see the pith. And if that pith is stacked in little cells like poker chips stacked together, that will be walnut. Uh, that's a trait that the walnut species have. Little leaf sumac. All of the sumacs were widely used by the Native Americans the Comanches chewed the bark and swallowed the juice for treating colds. That was kind of a treatment on the run. You could get that and peel a little bark off and keep riding away. Uh, California, the Indians around Valley applied the dried and powdered berries to smallpox sores. The Rama Navajo had many uses for sumac, using the leaves to cause impotency as a form of birth control and also used the bark of the root to expel the placenta during childbirth. So that one's kind of controversial. It's, it's used for two purposes, prevent pregnancy and treatment after pregnancy. Here's a close up of the leaves of little leaf sumac and the berries. Western half of the state of Texas is where it's kind of common from. Evergreen sumac, uh, as its name implies, does have kind of like live oak leaves throughout 11 months out of the year before they shed and put on new ones. But the dried leaves were often mixed with tobacco to make tobacco go a little further when they were smoking it. And it was also used as a treatment for asthma. And any of the sumacs, you can take the fresh of the year. You don't want last year's fruits, but the fresh fruits that turn red this summer, early fall, put those in water. It can either be cold steeped or it can be hot steeped. And it makes a refreshing drink. And in the old days, they called it sumac aid because there weren't any lemon trees in Texas to grow lemonade from, so they used sumacs and they called it sumac aid. Your skunk bush sumac, one of our more common uh, varieties, the Edwards Plateau, Transpecus, and it, it again shows up in a lot more counties than what this distribution map shows. Some people say the, the leaves with these notches, lobes on the end look like the toes of a puppy, puppy dog toes, they'll sometimes call it. Uh, the Cheyenne used a decoction of the leaves for colds, a diuretic. 
and they chewed the fruit for toothaches. Now I'd have to give you a warning about that. These seeds have got like a balloon. It's like an inflated balloon. The red part is the balloon and there's a brown hard seed on the inside, one seed, about two thirds the size of that inflated red balloon. So if you bit down wrong and tried to chew that fruit for a toothache, it's probably gonna give you a toothache. And again, now let's look at this plant and its distribution, Texas, New Mexico, Southern New Mexico, Southern Arizona. Now the Cheyenne, from what I read about their history, they were up in Minnesota. They moved over uh, to South Dakota, then to Wyoming. And uh, some of them split off and went down into Colorado, became the Southern Cheyenne. But even then, look how far away they are from this plant. And it, it was really strange why they would go so far to get this plant. And then I stumbled upon one more use for this plant. They said an old man took this medicine and bore a child. So maybe as an aphrodisiac, it would be worth crossing two states to get that plant. I don't know. Western soapberry. These berries contain 37% saponin, which is what is in a lot of soaps. And when you crush the berries and add a little water, it will lather up and was used as cleaners and soaps by many of the native tribes and early settlers who saw the natives using it for this purpose. It can cause dermatitis if you have sensitive skin. And although the berries are somewhat poisonous, there, there's been lots of uses for this plant in treating fevers, rheumatism, and kidney problems using those berries. So this is not China berry, this is the native Western soap berry. Mesquite, or more appropriately titled honey mesquite. The Apache used juice from the leaves for irritated eyelids. Now that's a, that's a specific use we hadn't seen before, irritated eyelids. The Native Americans didn't have sunglasses, so you probably would think being out in the sun all the time, they would have that issue of irritated eyelids. An infusion of the bark used to cure bedwetting by children. That's interesting. Prickly pear. Lots and lots of species of prickly pear in Texas. Opuntia is a wide variety of species. The pads were boiled and the juice made into a tea would cure gallstones. Tender young pads split open and used as a poultice to re reduce inflammation. And I read they also would, uh, after they broke off a pad, they would scrape all the thorns off best they could. And then they would heat that pad beside the fire, put it on a hot rock, then split it open. So you've got about a quarter inch thick gooey mass of warm uh, warmness to put on a injury or use as a poultice. So that would be one way of warming up that poultice, put it on a hot rock and let that pad heat up. And here's a couple of different species that are common, uh, commonly found in central Texas, Transpecus, Rolling Plains, South Texas even. American beauty berry. The Choctaw used a decoction of the roots for dysentery, stomach ache, dizziness. A decoction of the roots and berries mixed together was a treatment for colic. The Seminole used the root or stem bark for snake sickness. I would assume that's after you've been bit by a snake and they weren't treating sick snakes. Uh, itchy skin, urine retention. And then a lot of different tribes use the root and leaf teeth in sweat baths for rheumatism, fevers, and malaria. And as you notice in Texas, this occurs on the eastern half of the state, but American beautyberry is on the far western range of the beautyberry. It goes all the way to the Atlantic Ocean, and we're in the uh, far western edge of its adaptation. Beauty, beautyberry is appropriately named. Those uh, the magenta colored berries are beautiful uh, when they're in the full sun like this photo was taken. Yopon, lots of different uses. Ilex vomitoria. Vomitoria indicates vomit. So the Cherokee, Alabama, Creek, Natchez used a decoction of toasted or roasted leaves taken as a emetic. If you needed to throw up, they would run and find the Yopon. The Seminole used a bark, peeling off little pieces of this thin bark, and it's only, it's less than a 
sixteenth of an inch thick. It's not very thick to peel off, but they would take the bark and use it as a medicine for old people's dance sickness. Not sure what that means. Nightmarish dreams and for waking up talking. All various uh, symptoms that would probably make people notice that you weren't sleeping good. But the berries, uh, don't see a lot of use for the berries, but the leaves are where it got most of the use by the Native Americans. Yopon is naturally caffeinated. It has caffeine. And it was used as uh, the dried roasted leaves were used as a substitute for coffee when you didn't have coffee. And it could be used as a tea. And uh, there's a company down in Cat Springs, Texas that is selling Yopon tea. Uh, you can look them up on the internet and order some. They're taking a plant that has become almost uh, an aggressive pest and making a commercial use out of it. Again, eastern third of the state of Texas. We're on the eastern edge of the Yopon Range. All right, here's our last plant. This is a quiz now. What is the native plant most utilized for medicinal purposes by Native Americans? Uh, it's so hard to get an answer back. I'm going to just give you the answer. You might already wonder, why has he not talking about purple coneflower? Well, I saved it for the last. That is the most utilized plant for all native tribes. Look at these uses. I'm, I'm just, in, in yellow, I highlighted the uses. Toothache, coughs, cold, sore throat, snake bite, analgesic, poisonous snake bites, other poisonous bites, toothache, thirst preventative. Dressing for burns, anti-convulsive, gastrointestinal aid, coughs, sore throats, headaches, mumps, uh, thirsty or per perspiring, tonsillitis, and eye wash, smallpox, uh, balls, even would help cure distemper in horses. So just look at all the uses by all the different tribes. So Black Samson, also called purple coneflower. Look at where it grows. Pretty common in the Great Plains region. I don't have over here on the eastern side. If it goes very far east, it may. I cut that off to make it fit this space here. But this is one that's commonly eaten by cattle and deer, so it's sometimes grazed out of pastures. You may have a hard time finding it. Look in the bar ditch between the road and the fence, and that's where you're more likely to see it if it's out on rangeland that has livestock. Now this publication is a plant guide that comes from the USDA Plants Database. You can get to this if you just Google Plants Database and type in a plant name, type in purple coneflower, look down and you'll see a plant guide, hot one. Click on that, this pops up. That entire first page has ethnobotany uses. All the different uses by different tribes. Tremendous amount of information on its use and how to grow it here on the second page, how to grow it. Most of this data I got initially for the Forbes, the wildflowers, came from the Wildflowers of Texas book. Uh, I got some information from the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. Uh, they list several uh, sources there. USDA Plants Database lists several sources. And then look at the dates down here on these ones on the bottom, 1937, 1940, 1952. Some of those books were written when those people that would have been Teenagers or young people in the 1880s were still alive. So they were able to talk to the native peoples and find out what plants were used. That's where some of our good information has come from. And as, a, uh, as I went through this, I found an excellent resource. Didn't really know about it, but this is again the Plants Database. If you Google Plants Database, this page will come up right here, type a plant name in, type the, the easiest way is to type the scientific name, but you can hit this drop down and change it to common name or plant symbol. But if you type in Ilex vomitoria or Yopon right there, they're cross-referenced and it should come up with a page on the general tab that shows you where the plant, a distribution map of where the plant's found and history about whether it's native, annual, introduced, you know, all of that. Uh, then you've got this tab called Related Links. And I often go straight to this Lady Bird Johnson site because it will hot link straight to it. And then I noticed this Native American Ethnobotany website. 
I clicked on it and it bring, it actually takes you to a website that says that link is no longer active. Click here to take, to be taken to the current site. So when you click there, you'll come to this site. And now you type in the plant name, scientific name or common name. Uh, I typed in Yopon and hit okay and look at all the choices. And there's, there's a, uh, I don't know, in, in this one, there's nine. I've seen some that had 30 different tribes, different uses. Some were medicinal, some were uses as food, but this is a great resource, tremendous bit of information. And it even gives you the reference of where you can go to find more information about a particular treatment, medicinal use, or more about that plant. So in summary, the medicine chest of the Native Americans is still out there. It's been out there for thousands of years. They still use it, uh, but when synthetic medicines came about, the settlers, the, the Europeans that came to the United States, synthetic medicines were easier to find. You didn't have to go hunt for them. You didn't have to cook them down. You could just open up a box, pull that peel, peel out, and take the peel. Uh, the peels would last a long time, so we got away from using the native plants, but hopefully you'll see that there's, those plants are still out there and with a little knowledge of what plant to use and what it can be used for, it would be interesting to treat some of these uh, elements that we have now with the native plants.